everybody. Good afternoon. This is Jen kovach bordnik with the eHealth Initiative and Foundation. We've got a great webinar ready for you this afternoon, and we're just going to give folks a moment to jump on. We have several hundred people joining us today to talk about remote monitoring in the era of COVID-19. So um, a very pertinent topic today. I know a lot of you are interested in what's going on around um, not just the country, but really around the globe right now related to COVID-19. And we've got a great group with us today to talk about um, their experiences in Israel. So this is um, very timely and we're glad that you could join us. While we're waiting for folks to join, Claudia, um, why don't I just go through a few housekeeping items? So again, this is Jen kovach bordnik I'm the CEO of the eHealth Initiative and Foundation. I wanna welcome you for joining us today. Uh, next slide. We've got an incredible group of panelists with us here today to talk about their experiences, um, starting with um, Al Canel, who's the president of Strategic Interest, um, Bridget Weefling. Uh, Dr. Weefling is the senior VP of primary care at the Advanced Solutions Institute at Rochester Regional Health, really right there in the middle of the crisis right now. Um, I think we've heard a lot about Rochester on the news and, and certainly we're interested to hear from her today. And thank you for joining us. Um, Levi Shapiro, the founder of M Health Israel and Uri Bedish, who's the founder and CEO at Datos, again, dealing you know, right in the center of this crisis right now. So delighted that they were able to join us today. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I know this is a really difficult time and um, we're thinking of all of our providers out there, um, our nurses, our clinicians, um, everybody out there on the front lines dealing with this really tough um, time right now. It's challenging times, I think, for everybody, but particularly for those um, involved in um, direct patient care right now. So our, our thoughts are with you. Um, for those of you who are able to join us today, thank you for doing so. And, and we wanna get you as involved as possible in um, the presentation today. And we know you might have a lot of questions. Um, so we have a way for you to ask questions. There's a Q&A box right there at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's two boxes actually. There's one that says chat and one that says Q&A. Um, if you wanna ask a question to one of the panelists or speakers, go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. That's where your content question goes. If you're having technical difficulties, stick something in the chat box. Um, and we're already getting questions about the slides. The slides are available on our website right now at uh, www.ehidc.org in the resource center slash resources. Um, and oh, great, Ali on our team, um, Ali Mamrao has also um, put a link to the slides there in the chat box for you. So if you're looking for those, you have those as well. For those of you who are not familiar with the eHealth Initiative, we are a nonprofit. We're going on our 20th anniversary. Um, we've got a pretty incredible group of leaders around the country from some of the most prestigious organizations involved in our research education and advocacy. And this is just a sampling of some of the different groups. Um, again, many of these groups involved on the front lines today dealing with this crisis. Next slide. And what we try to do is convene executives across the spectrum of healthcare. So labs, payers, providers, researchers, policy makers, all of those different folks to figure out how do you use technology and innovation to improve care. Next slide. And generally what we focus on are issues like um, privacy and security and interoperability and analytics, um, value-based care, prior authorization, those sorts of things, um, which are really um, in the day-to-day -day of healthcare, um, critical issues that we're dealing with. Uh, next slide. But right now, um, because of this crisis, we have a number of different um, both educational um, research and policy initiatives we're directly involved with in the COVID-19 issue. Um, we started the series looking at different um, ways that we can use technology and innovation to really help support payers and providers and patients right now um, during the COVID-19 um, epidemic. Um, in addition to that, we've been directly involved in um, helping to ensure that um, key resources are available in the stimulus packages um, one, two, and three that have gone forward, particularly around um, telehealth and payment and trying to ease up on a lot of those regulations to help providers so that they can just focus on giving care 
and not worry about getting paid for it um, or getting in trouble for using technology and innovation. Um, so we're doing the best we can to support and we are very interested in, in doing more. So let us know if you have an idea about another topic area we could focus on or um, another area that we should be thinking about. Next slide. And I do want to thank um, Al Canal and Strategic Interests. Um, really an incredible, Al's been a great friend to eHealth Initiative over the years. And without his generosity, we wouldn't be able to bring this program to you today to really talk about remote monitoring. And Al knows a lot about um, this area. He's been involved in it for years and years. And I know his group is doing a lot of great work um, on this. So thank you for being a leader in the field there, Al. And um, I think I'm going to turn it over to you, actually, so you can help get us introduced to everybody. Thanks, Al. Thank you so much, Jen. And thanks to EHI for the opportunity to share best practices with such a large audience that is looking for ways to address the horrific crisis our nation is facing. Again, our thoughts and prayers are also out to those who are suffering in peril, especially those braving health risks to help. EHI is an incredible resource for convening cross-functional stakeholders to address significant problems in healthcare with a focus on innovation and HIT. As Jen mentioned, I have a long history of working with EHI. Uh, we can personally thank EHI for helping our community research the original nine connecting communities, Pilot Rios in 2004. This information helped us align and form the foundation of knowledge that we learned at Rochester Rio. Janet Marchabroda then put us to work to help EHI facilitate the very first New York State HIT Summit when there was no roadmap, like today. Again, an opportunity to learn. So our firm's strategic interests had the pleasure of uh, helping providers, payers, collaboratives with initiatives to improve care and lower costs. And we've been participating in EHI events and have shared best practices on quite a few different practices. Most are not our thoughts, but others, but we like helping share. Some featured our clients or people we have come across, others are EHI members or contacts of people that were members. The network of network applies to knowledge and EHI is at the epicenter of HIT. We need to leverage that today. Strategic Interest has been a member of EHI for several years. We've learned from experiences and bring them to our clients and also help in the communities that we serve. Also had the opportunity to give back to EHI in time and knowledge. It's very fulfilling. It's humbling when you bring people in that know so much about the challenges, solutions, workflows, and policy issues around different topics. Today is no exception. While today's topic is very important, it is also very urgent. Much more urgent than any EHI event I remember. Hospitals are overwhelmed, insufficient beds, ICU ventilators, et cetera. The brave staff is at risk, reducing capacity to tend to the sick. We need to monitor populations but we need collaboration amongst different players, hospitals, public health, like never before. I rarely have had the opportunity or pleasure of facilitating a best practice discussion that's so close to home. This session describes what is being done to help our community stay safe in the midst of crisis. We have been, Rochester Regional has been featured with EHI task forces on data and analytics, featuring epic interoperability and other things that they're really good at. This is different. They're back with an amazing woman, Dr. Bridget Weefling, and her title has already been mentioned. Um, and her approach to monitoring patients while remaining at home in isolation or quarantine. I have worked with Dr. Weefling for years in Rochester, where she's known as a visionary and a driver for change. She understands the clinical business and technical challenges of medicine and effectively navigates the politics within a large organization and the community of stakeholders around her with whom she collaborates. This affects large-scale transformation of complex initiatives. It's not the first time Dr. Weefling has helped EHI. She presented on the use of telemedicine to support urban health challenges in 2005. I think she was 19 at the time. <laughs> but this story is different. It's not about the clinical and operational challenges and how IT and process design can make it happen. It's about the assessment of a situation, a dire situation, bringing insight, open-mindedness, and courage to decide a course of action in the midst of battle when we have so little time and so much to do, and having the conviction to lead the organization and focus to get the mission accomplished. I would like to ask Dr. Weefling to tell her story. 
Thanks, Al. That was um, that was a really sweet introduction. <laughs> uh, I hope today's um, I hope today's uh, talk gives you some um, some insight, and also I implore you to take it very seriously because uh, we have been learning, uh, like many of you, as um, COVID has been uh, hitting us like a wave um, across the state of New York. Uh, we've been learning uh, more about what's needed to manage the disease, what we are prepared for, what we're not prepared for. And uh, if nothing else, it is testing our ability to, ability to be agile uh, like nothing before. So um, I wanted to just kind of give you a sense of Rochester Regional. Uh, I don't know if I have control of this. Okay, I think I don't. I think you guys have control of the slides. So uh, Rochester Regional is a, we're a large um, integrated uh, delivery network. We have five hospital locations, um, a few uh, affiliated hospitals. We have um, 19,000 plus employees. We have a very large uh, primary care footprint with more than 100 offices. And uh, we offer, you know, we're a uh, you know, very standard tertiary quaternary large system. We have um, ambulatory surgery. We have um, a home care, a very large um, home care organization, behavioral health. Uh, we have um, CPEP. We've got uh, a large um, lab presence. We also oversee ACM, which is a worldwide lab uh, for com a commercial lab. And um, we have uh, several home care uh, organizations that we either own directly or that we're overseeing uh, from the standpoint of um, a contractual relationship so basically large integrated delivery network covering 13 uh, counties and um, a lot of lives, a lot of lives. So next slide. So we, telehealth has been something that I've been spearheading for a number of years um, in, in Rochester and Rochester Regional Health is a very forward thinking organization. We're very lucky. Uh, Dr. Eric Bieber is our CEO and he is, very, uh, very forward thinking. He's uh, very much uh, a promoter of leveraging technology to get uh, work done across our uh, large footprint and to help us to be more integrated and to make sure that our patients have access uh, in the place that they need it at the time that they need it and that we're preciously using our scarce resources, which is, you know, many of our specialty uh, providers, as you know, uh, they, we want to consolidate the amount of time that they're spent doing uh, wasteful things and be very focused on how do we get their services to our rural areas and we're not driving them around in a car, but you know, can we, can we help to facilitate them being able to manage care at a distance. So we've, do, we've been doing a lot with overseeing our, our more rural ICUs, um, using Cisco carts um, and telehealth for 15 years plus. Uh, we were early embracers of Epic Virtual Care and uh, we also have an e-health at home team that's using te uh, technology in the home to try to keep some of those patients that are the sickest like our LVAD patients and our congestive heart failure patients in their home and managing their sort of CHF tune-up uh, in the home rather than bringing them into the hospital. Uh, we are in um, multiple quality contracts about 75 to 85 percent of our lives right now are under a quality contract which has upside downside risk. So again uh, we're Pretty, we're leaning forward in the population health management uh, space. And so we were very poised uh, when uh, COVID hit us to be able to pivot a lot of our technology advancements into how do we leverage these uh, technologies to manage our population. And we had been in a relationship uh, with Datos uh, because we were looking at using it for a different population. Uh, we weren't really looking at it to, to use for uh, COVID at the time, we had been working with them around diabetes and, and hi hypertension and how do we think about AI use. And so they've been sort of a thought partner with us. Next slide. So this is just to get, you know, to give you a sense um, of uh, the way COVID has been hitting us uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Certainly uh, seeing it showing up in primary care, urgent cares and emergency rooms. You know, the problem that we had, obviously, just like everyone else, I think, uh, we did not have uh, rapid uh, widespread testing. And so it was in our community uh, lingering around uh, without us knowing it. Um, and so as it started to uh, become, as, it started, as we started to become aware of it, it really blossomed. Uh, and 
we were very lucky because uh, uh, Governor Cuomo did pretty much lock the state down relatively quickly, I think. And so that is, I think, helping us. We're hoping it's going to stem, uh, flatten the curve, so to speak. And you can maybe see an inkling of that on this slide. Um, but we immediately kind of in that in that week of between the um, between 314 and and uh, 320, uh, we really started to see it these cases everywhere. And again, these are this slide is just showing you the cases that were actually tested. Um, this isn't uh, the prevalence. And so I'm going to speak to that in a minute, the prevalence, because I think that's something that we stumbled across uh, that where uh, Danos became extremely important to us. That's when we realized it was important to us. Next. So from a preparedness perspective, uh, we, we, started, um, we started immediately, uh, March 3rd is actually the date that we began uh, a focus in, focused intense work on getting ready for COVID-19. Uh, we had had our, you know, our standard infection prevention task force that's been meeting you know, on a regular basis talking about this and you know, contemplating whether it was gonna hit us and what was gonna be needed. But I would say that sort of all hands on deck really uh, happened on the 3rd of March and um, and then certainly uh, even accelerated more on the 14th. But our initial uh, focus in the ambulatory space, because that's the, that, that is the space that I um, am, am in, was to focus on kind of four buckets, workforce management, materials management, patient flow and volume, and communication and education. And so we created um, our toolkit and our playbook, which I'm happy to help share, you know, I'm happy to share with anyone who, who would like to see it uh, after this is over. It really has become our Bible that we are continuing today, uh, even to use to help to manage uh, the services, the communication, the strategy, and the, um, uh, the clinical uh, care of the COVID patients uh, throughout our region. And so in uh, using this tool, uh, we recognized that it was a great way of also uh, helping to direct care. Um, from a materials management perspective, you know, obviously you're hearing about it all across in all the news. You know, we, we recognize there's PPE issues and ventilator issues and meds and hospital equipment. And so we, we knew uh, out of the gate that as we were starting to re-architect outpatient care, it, that would be necessary in order to make sure that we uh, were providing enough access to our patients, but we needed to provide access in a way that it was safe for our healthcare workers as well as safe for the patients. So we focused a lot on the use of urgent care. And when I say urgent care, I mean outside urgent care. So tent city, we call it, uh, as a way of, of managing uh, keeping patients in an outdoor space because we didn't have a lot of rooms that are negative pressure rooms, uh, which you really need in an inpatient, in an indoor space if you're gonna manage or see uh, patients with potential COVID or COVID. And so uh, we also uh, pivoted our uh, primary care footprint pretty much on a, on a dime because we had a lot of ability to use virtual care. So we you know, tapered down the um, the on-site uh, primary care visits immediately and pushed out uh, virtual care. Uh, and uh, that pr proved to be very effective, uh, an effective mechanism to do that. I think the, the key thing next was really around patient flow and volume and understanding that uh, we're, we're, we're not necessarily bringing these folks into the office because uh, these are patients with you know, respiratory symptoms, fever, cough, myalgias. Uh, potentially some GI symptoms. We're not bringing them into the office if we can avoid it. So we needed to have places for them to go that were safe to be, to get an x-ray to make sure that we're not missing a, a bacterial pneumonia or to make sure that this wasn't COPD um, and that uh, to give them the opportunity to get um, um, uh, nebulizer treatment safely because you can't nebulize in an office that doesn't have uh, negative pressure or you're shutting down the room for two hours and then cleaning it. So we created the opportunity for our patients to go to these um, tent facilities uh, to be able to get that sort of work up uh, that would be needed because our primary care providers can't, you know, couldn't actually examine the patients. And that worked really well. What we also knew is, and recognized pretty quickly just within a couple of days is because we didn't have testing and the guidance that the county was giving us was, hey, we have very limited access to testing. We only had the ability to test 21 patients in Monroe County. 
Um, and so our hospital system, uh, because we are pretty advanced in our lab skills, developed a new, um, they developed a new uh, uh, testing uh, procedure that we were able to use. And so that was still limited, that testing, um, that was still limited, it was 100 a day. So we went from 21 to 100 a day. But that meant that there were a whole lot of people that were showing up with signs, symptoms that were COVID and telling us the prevalence was higher than what our testing ca capability allowed us. And so we said, okay, as a primary care provider, what I'm saying to all these patients is, I can't test you. I think you have COVID. You don't have bacterial pneumonia. So I'm gonna send you home and I want you to self-isolate, to self-quarantine for 14 days because that's what's, you know, that's what's going to be safest for you, your family, and the community around us. Um, in doing that, these patients are afraid. Uh, they're, they're seeing the news. They're hearing that everybody dies. And um, even though it, you know, it, it, it's not that everybody dies, but that's what they're hearing and they were afraid. And so we said, we've got to have a way of managing this population that we're telling to go home and self-monitor. And we needed something that was going to be... Um, more automated. And so we turned to our partners in Dados and uh, started to talk to them about what they were doing um, in, in Israel and said, hey, I think that we can take this and use this tool immediately because we've got telehealth limitations um, as far as the breadth and scope that we have the ability to reach. Uh, we have lack of access to testing. So identifying a large uh, population of patients that we uh, were assuming presumed positive. We also were seeing that our healthcare workers were turning up positive or they were being exposed and uh, being asked to self-quarantine. And as you're taking the healthcare workforce out of play, there's less people to take care of people. And so that started to look like it was, you know, it doesn't take much to see it as potentially becoming a crisis. And so we needed a way to manage that healthcare workforce better to get them back to work more quickly if they weren't, um, if they weren't actually positive. And if they were positive, how do, we, how do we work with them to get them still back quicker as soon as they're feeling better? Because most, for most people, it is a mild illness. And then the other thing that we recognized in doing this work is we were working closely with the county and their guidelines and they were starting, the county was starting to see they're, they're, they're under-resourced and they needed a way to manage all of these patients that they're seeing and isolating um, with, a, with a very small workforce and not a lot of tools and technology. So that was really the, the, the way that Dados came to be for us as a great solution. Next slide. So I put this slide up here just to, to help you understand kind of the thought process we went through over 10 days. You know, basically I called up Al um, and, and talked to Al and he said, I have this product. I think you should take a look at it. Let me know if it's something that can help. You know, I, I, I took a look at what the Dados team had done uh, to their architecture and immediately, like within five minutes, I was like, this is exactly what we need because by now we're already like in the middle of it and starting to see cases. So we pulled in our privacy team, our IT and privacy and security team quickly. You know, John Glenn heads that up for us and he's amazing and his team's been amazing. And uh, they really acted quickly uh, for us as well as uh, helping us to develop the business case so that we could get legal on board and, uh, and our finance team on board. And then we launched these implementation critical paths around how, how do we wanna use this data tool to help us to manage our, employee, our employees who've been exposed or maybe symptomatic how did we want to recruit? What kind of workforce was going to man the tool for us? So, we, you know, nursing. We needed a physician champion, so we identified um, Dr. Natalie Gulab, who is a public health um, specialist, and she's been fabulous uh, at being able to think through the different avenues around how we want to use the tool. And then we needed a project manager to, to help us to move quickly so that we could get patients into the tool, get practices up and educated on what they needed to do. And also, um, you know, working with uh, the Dados team and Al's team at SI to help us to customize it to be what it needed to be for us. Um, we brought HR in early. I think that was really key. Um, we also uh, brought in some of our primary care providers to make sure that we would have the um, support from the primary care providers and they were gladly uh, willing to, to use this tool from the standpoint of referring patients to it. Uh, because they were seeing the same need as far as how am I supposed to manage these patients? I can't see them. And they, if you are, if you are in a place where you're seeing COVID, you know that the patients that get sick, they get sick very quickly. Um, and you need to be watching them uh, because you want to get them safely transferred um, to an emergency room for, um, 
for airway management uh, as, as smoothly and efficiently as possible. And so being able to keep tabs on how these patients are doing, we believe is gonna be the key to our success as we are starting to uh, begin to enter the surge phase currently. And then uh, we also, like I said, we brought in the county to talk to them about what they were doing um, and how we might be able to help them because my community is their community. And so if anything, if I can do anything to help them uh, with being able to manage better, it was gonna be good for us. Lastly, I think on that, we did feel the need to create an epic order set and that has been great because we've been able to track the number of patients that our primary care providers are referring to self-isolation. And so it just gives us an additional reporting tool. And then by you know 10 days, Friday, March 20th, we launched um, and we have continued with a PDSA process uh, uh, in order to get it to be exactly what we needed to be for each of the different work streams that we created. Next slide. So use cases, outcomes, challenges, this is really the result. Um, we're using it for patients that are presumed positive self-isolation. We're using it for COVID positive patients that we're managing. We're using it for exposed healthcare workers. Um, our outcomes so far are, uh, you know, our, our patients who get put onto the tool absolutely considered a godsend uh, because they feel very alone. They feel, feel very isolated. They feel very afraid. And this tool, because of the fact that it is, it's a twice a day reporting tool with a risk, um, with a uh, risk um, algorithm running in the background so that a nurse can easily see that someone start that, you know, they're green and then they go yellow and then they go red. The, the nurse can reach out immediately and, um, and, see, and see them by video and talk to them and ease them through whatever's going on and then get them handed off back to their primary care provider or to the next level of care if needed. Uh, we, we're seeing that it's reducing ED utilization from the standpoint of these patients aren't afraid um, and so they're not running to the emergency room. Uh, we're able to sort of manage them through some of their anxiety and use urgent care uh, for x-rays and nebulizers and things like that. Um, and it's also, we're seeing it as a, a way that we're able to get, we're able to track our healthcare workers so we can get them back to work quicker because they're reporting their fever, their, um, their temperature every day and their symptoms. So we can see when they've crossed the threshold of three days symptom free and fever free so we can get them back to work. Challenges, um, getting the right workflow for patients, you know, with problems has been a little bit of a challenge because is it, you know, is it really in the primary care provider, is it best to hand it back to the primary care provider or is it better for um, the provider that's using the tool uh, to be managing that person once they get put into the tool? We, we've been running it both ways to try to see which is the most efficient. And um, so I think that's still work that we're, that those are still some kinks we're working out. Um, and then we do have some of the double management of patients because some of our employees are also our primary care patients. And so, you know, we've decided that we're just going to accept the fact that some of our patients, our employees are going to get two messages um, a day. And we think that more, more communication with them is better than less communication. And then I think the other challenge that we're seeing is how to help the county. Uh, one of the things that our, the county had really said they needed was the ability to track patients um, epidemiologically. Uh, but also uh, from the standpoint of they don't have a lot of people to go to the houses to knock on doors and make sure people are home. And so there was some, some discussion around, you know, how do we use um, geocoding and, and should we use geocoding? And um, I think there's some policy issues that, um, you know, would be something this team could probably uh, take up and address. You know, we're, we live in America, so we don't really believe in that. Um, but at the same time, there are public health needs that may require patients to, um, to agree to say, you know, to let the counties know where they're at because epidemiologically, it can, it can help us to understand the disease more, uh, but also it's a way of also knowing that patients are home. Uh, not the business that Rochester Regional Health wants to be in, but it definitely was something that came up uh, through the work that we've been doing. So I think those Thank are you. the main, main areas. Yeah, thank you so much, Bridget. And, and I tell you, it's incredible to work with you. And there's nothing more fulfilling than uh, working on uh, helping improve uh, care in your community at a time of a crisis. So I thoroughly enjoy working with you. Uh, now we're going to shift, and we'll have to be a little short on time, but uh, that was worth it. That was the main attraction, so we're, we're fine with that. But we want to hear about how another nation 6,000 miles away uh, is dealing with the coronavirus situation, and one organization, Sheba Medical, a top 10 uh, in the world, 
has creatively used a myriad of technologies to bring the technology to the home, bring the hospital to the home. I know Israel very well. It's similar to the U.S. in many ways, but different in others. And we do share and collaborate on many purposes. Pockets of this occur in digital health, but we can do much more to help each other. The war against coronavirus is a good time to be aligned with well-intentioned, critical thinkers we can trust. Levi Shapiro is one of them. He knows all about knowledge sharing on the subject of digital health and sharing best practices. He's made it his second career to share it with the world. He's the head of the digital health program at Hebrew University's Biomed MBA program and the founder of M Health Israel, a nonprofit with uh, uh, over 7,500 members supporting that community. Levy will uh, briefly share uh, what uh, has, as Sheba has done, which includes uh, Datos, the solution that Bridget just shared about, but is broader than that and how they're applying it for coronavirus in Israel. Thank you, Levy. Thank you for the introduction. And I will um, request, um, I'll say slide when it's time to advance. So um, although this is a very serious uh, moment, um, if we can move to the next slide, I'd actually like to begin on a lighter note. Um, if we could advance, there we go. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Gartner hype cycle uh, in which a trigger leads to um, a whole series of uh, phases with the introduction of emerging technologies. Uh, well, many of us now are experiencing the uh, cycle for e experiencing quarantine. Uh, so depending, we started probably a bit earlier than uh, Israel, so I'm somewhere near this trough of disillusionment and therefore very happy to be joining uh, 700 virtual friends. Um, but I, I think um, we're, we're all learning as we go. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, just a note about um, uh, M Health Israel. It's basically the EHI of uh, Israel, very large membership. And the goal is uh, supporting our health technology community. Next slide, please. So as we're waiting for the, this is the next slide. Um, I wanna just point out before we uh, do a deep dive into a particular case study from Sheba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in the Middle East and it's ranked number nine uh, globally by Newsweek. Um, I want to just take a step back and from the point of view of someone who's very active in emerging technologies, I really view this moment as a, a trigger, uh, an inflection point in terms of uh, the technologies we will see after this crisis. Specifically, until now, we've been very siloed. Uh, bio was completely distinct from digital health, which was also very distinct from med tech. I think COVID is going to push us towards an era of bioconvergence, just as perhaps the Affordable Care Act um, brought on major changes uh, in health technologies. So um, very interesting time. Now let's take a deep dive into how uh, Sheba is using telemedicine uh, as a critical tool to address COVID-19. Next slide, please. The principal goal of their efforts, if we can go to the next slide, was uh, maximizing the protection of their staff. So offering a high level of medical care, but minimal, minimal physical contact. I think this is the problem that all of us face. Uh, Israel reacted a bit more um, quickly, I would say, than what we've seen uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and now I'd like to share how uh, Sheba is addressing um, across three dimensions. Next slide. So essentially, uh, these fall into three buckets. Um, communications, monitoring, and physical examination. Um, Sheba used some local technologies. None of these technologies are um, let's call them frontier technologies. These were all existing technologies using uh, tools that were already in the market and quickly adapted for the crisis. And so uh, next slide, we're going to begin by looking in the communications bucket. 
the goal was how to leverage communications technologies in order to create inpatient telehospitalization, something that's never happened before. A quarantine experience with zero physical contact. Next slide, please. And so a variety of communication tools were adopted, uh, including, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, how to monitor uh, all of these activities remotely. Um, so uh, within communications, there was a, uh, a company called Uniper. Uniper, which we'll see in the next slide, not only delivers uh, the communications required for that uh, zero contact goal, but there's also a series of backup technologies, including telephone, mobile phone, an emergency button, security cameras, et cetera. Next slide, please. So um, Uniper is essentially taking a technology that uh, many elderly are quite uh, comfortable with, which is a simplified remote control. There's a camera attached to the television and a built-in microphone. This enables full uh, dual communications, uh, both with family as well as with caregivers. Next slide, please. And I'm going to go quickly here. This enables video visits. That's the patient holding the remote control, which is equipped with a microphone. Next slide. Group visits. So there's one individual who is basically a quarterback of all of the different stakeholders uh, in remote locations. Next slide, please. And virtual family visits. So uh, the loneliness is less of a factor. Next slide. That was, that was how communications is being addressed uh, in this goal of zero contact. I want to now uh, take a deep dive into the monitoring function. Next slide. And we're going to talk about another uh, product that has been in the market for some time called uh, Early Sense. You can see the flat um, equipment. This is a contact-free uh, sensor-based monitor, which is measuring with zero contact, heart rate, respiratory rate, motion, all of that appears on a screen, and it is uh, predicting deterioration. Next slide, please. Let's break out now the physical examination. Uh, Taito is another, all of these are Israeli companies. Taito has uh, a number of FDA approved uh, products for telemedicine. These have been applied for this um, inpatient telehospitalization requirement. So let's move to the next slide. And this is um, an example of some of their uh, existing technologies. Next slide. Uh, and how they're being uh, used with a back-end monitoring system so that there can be remote daily rounds and frequent monitoring. Next slide. Finally, uh, there's some other tools. I'll just point out one more, um, a, a telepresence robot. And the robot enables uh, caregivers in different locations to be virtually present uh, in the special care room. So staff can uh, exchange best practices, uh, even if their colleagues are uh, in a safe location. Next slide. Um, the goal now is to further reduce min uh, physical contact, uh, if we can advance the slide. And again, we'll advance the slide. And one of the ways to do that, next slide please, uh, is another um, sensor-based tool. Uh, that is called BioBeat, which measures, uh, uh, BioBeat measures across, um, it's a patch, and it measures across 14 vital signs. And um, basically, we'll just summarize, essentially, all of these activities are um, existing technologies that have just been integrated toward a higher purpose. Um, they're live, they are trying to bring um, uh, medical care for the isolated patients, the home hospitalization, and the ambulatory patients. Last slide. And I will, uh, 
I guess, finish uh, on the last slide, if we can move forward, um, we went a little further than we planned. We're going to hear from Datos, which is, we're really uh, making some progress. Um, let's hand it over to Datos. Datos uh, is part of this Sheba solution, and Uri Betash, the CEO, can do a great job of talking about how they do it. Great. Thank you, Levi. Um, thank you, Al and um, Dr. Wilping. Uh, my name is Uri Betish, and I'm the CEO and founder of Dados Health. And um, in Dados, uh, we've developed an automated remote care and a telemedicine platform under one roof. Um, when the corona um, virus started, uh, basically, um, we've developed a remote care program, program that is tailored for the, for the COVID-19 um, positive patients um, home hospitalization program. Since that, um, the Ministry of Health uh, in Israel basically contracted us and um, is now deploying across the nation the home hospitalization solution for the positive COVID-19 patients. And um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the platform. And um, please go to the next slide. Very good. Um, today in the COVID-19 um, world, we offer two, um, two main solutions. One is the home hospitalizations that I just mentioned. And the other one is virtual clinics, where we transform all the hospital ambulatory call services um, to, a vir to virtual in a matter of day. And um, the, the, the biggest advantage of that solution is that it doesn't require the patients to download an app or to register to the process. We just send the link, and by pressing that link that we send via text message, the patients can be, um, um, can, the patient can, can be in, in a video call with the doctor um, without any downloading, uh, without downloading the app or um, register to the, to the process. And it's really important these days because uh, we have to remember that in regular days, um, telemedicine can be an opt-in um, solution, meaning that patients they have a choice. But these days, patients do not have a choice, and um, it's really important for us to, to support um, all patients and all populations. And a, simple, uh, a simple solution is critical in these days. On the home hospitalization um, solution that we are deploying using our app, um, where we monitor both symptoms and vitals and provide telemedicine services all under one roof with one app, um, most, of the, most of the program is being done automatically with the patients. That's the ability of the platform to manage um, patients automatically and to understand based on outcome um, um, different um, care, care pathways. And that solution today um, basically, and, and that fact basically allows the solution to manage a very large population um, um, in a matter of, uh, um, in, in, in a very efficient manner. Um, it also protects the hospitals and the care teams from flooding, um, uh, from, from um, over overloading and, and, um, and flooding with uh, positive corona patients. So only the, the most acute patients will visit the hospital. And another, another important thing that we just learned recently is that we, we allow, um, we have many medical, um, um, care, uh, medical teams that are basically being now quarantined, and we still allow them to provide care remotely, even during the quarantine. I, I actually would like to, to stop here, and I would like to um, give some um, room for Q&As. Uh, Q um, so, Claudio, would you like to, to take over? Great. Thank you very much, um, Uri. That's terrific. And it's less about the specifics and more about the story and, and how we've uh, been able to take some, some great innovation and, uh, and pull it together um, here for, uh, for use in the U.S. Uh, Dr. Weefling, uh, you mentioned that the, the engagement of patients does make them feel better about the plight of their situation. Does it really help them feel that someone's there for them? Because there's so many in the nation that are that are left alone without a, a clinician um, aware of their situation. Dr. Weefling? Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, that's the feedback that we're getting from the patients that are, uh, that are in the tool now, is that uh, they, they like having something to focus on that they know that they're submitting information and somebody's paying attention. 
uh, that they're not forgotten. Um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of people are living alone um, in our community that are that are on this tool. A lot of them are in households, but they're, you know, isolated to a room, and everybody's afraid of the household, and they're, you know, not wanting to come out into the living space and 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 potentially infect their loved ones. I mean, people are dealing with a lot of emotional issues on top of the fact that they're sick. Yeah, and then how how would you different different kind of question? How would you characterize discussions between? Uh, your health system in the county to maximize coverage in the community because they, they each has different uh, perspectives and we haven't really had to, to do this before having health systems talking so much to public health departments. Yeah, we have a we're lucky here. We have a really good relationship with our, our health department and we deal with we're dealing with 13 health departments. So uh, we've worked most closely right now with Monroe County, which is our largest one. Um, we we noticed quickly that it was going to take all hands on deck. So all of the healthcare, all of the large healthcare providers in our community and the county to be able to get in place a very a safe public health uh, plan, as well as to be advocating for the resources that we needed. Uh, you know, we, we sometimes run into issue because uh, New York City uh, does draw a lot of resources in New York State. And so we didn't uh, we didn't want to be left behind. And so being a being a voice together was important. The Dados tool I recognized early on just from you know comments that our public health department leaders were saying is, wow, you know this is not something we've been staffed to manage at the magnitude that we are. And so how do we partner together to use and leverage uh, the resources that you have as a large health integrated health system to help us to take care and meet our public health. Uh, duties and responsibilities safely. And so uh, the Dados tool uh, really was one of those ways that we felt we could help uh, because it allows for management of a lot of patients uh, with a, a lot fewer staff um, just from the standpoint of tracking. Great. And uh, Uri, if, if you don't mind, if there are certain uh, clinical elements related to the virus that telehealth cannot help with. In your opinion, which of the symptoms or aspects of COVID-19 pandemic that uh, telehealth does help most? And, and as the, the journey continues, what will be next uh, beyond what we're doing today? Um, thank you, Al. I, I think that, um, as I mentioned before, what we can do with our system is to track vitals and symptoms and to spot um, deterioration. And, um, and when needed to, to provide care <clears throat> and video consultations with the patients directly. I think that the, the next um, phase probably will be, will be some, something more in the direction of an, an AI and more, um, more sophisticated um, early detection um, tools to, to understand who are the patients that are going to be deteriorated. And it's not on, it's, it, it can also take data from, from other um, sources, not only the, the data platform, we can look at um, uh, demographical data, um, geographical data, and um, and um, and even in Israel, and even we, we, we have an app which, which is an open source, by the way, that can tell you um, um, how much time you you have been near a corona patient based on your GPS tracking. By the way, fully private, and like there's no tracking; it's an open source, but it still tell me um, how much time I spent near um, known corona um, positive corona patients and to in, um, integrate all this data into a sophisticated AI tool, I think that's, um, that, that, that can be a very good um, um, roadmap, uh, roadmap item, but, uh, but I hope that we, we won't need it, but um, the suggestion will be over soon. Okay. And uh, I have other questions, but I'd like to see if we have some uh, here from the audience here. Yeah, um, a lot of people are asking about the toolkit, I think, that Dr. Weepling was talking about, or the playbook, the playbook. That... Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one, one of the things I recommend for, for you, if you're, you know, if you're responsible for helping to manage this for your systems is, uh, from, especially from the standpoint of your use of telehealth, I would put together, you know, a toolkit that gives them the, the how-tos in a very basic way of how to quickly use uh, telehealth solutions to manage patients, the guidance around what kinds of patients are appropriate to manage uh, using uh, telehealth versus those that may not be, and some guidance as to what to do with them. Also, you know, making sure that you have different 
different technologies for different kinds and groups of providers and ensuring that in that toolkit, you've got guidance for each one of them so that there's just in time learning. Um, that, that's one ask, that's one module of our toolkit with there's multiple modules. Are you willing Thank to share you. what you guys have developed? Yeah, so if you give me the list of people that are looking for something like that, um, I will, I'll go through it and, and work, I'll work through it, yep. Okay, so if you guys can email us through the um, chat box and let us know your email, we'll um, get back to you. And then Dr. Weefling, the other question people are wondering is do you, in terms of staffing, do you have someone basically monitoring this 24 seven? How does that work? Yeah, we do actually. So that's, uh, we've got a, a group of nurses um, and now we're, interestingly, we are redeploying our pathologists uh, to work this tool for us. Uh, because we, as you know, as, as we move into surge, uh, we're looking to redeploy folks who may not be as busy um, in their current uh, job and job description, uh, because as things turn more and more to COVID, uh, we're needing more and more support in different places. And so we are, um, we're, we're using different workforce differently in order to accomplish this. Great. And then there's a lot of questions about, um, let's see if I can summarize this, um, kind of the order sets you're using with EPIC around presumed positive. Yeah. So we thought it was important for us to be able to track these individuals and, and then use that as not just track them, but it, use it as a mechanism for um, batch uploading into Datos. Uh, mm -hmm. So by, by being able to run a report on which patients are self-isolated, then our nursing team can actually go down through and um, and enter, you know, using using batch and enter this list that we pull out of Epic uh, each day. So, so, I mean, so one of the yeah one of the things we'll be doing next will be or might be doing next is that integration between Epic and Datos, and that sort of would make it even easier uh, to to do so. But that has not been developed uh, in war. It was get a solution up and running. You know, this keeps coming up on webinars, the whole presumed positive population um, <laughs> that's being treated out there. And I guess, you know, the, this group is not getting counted in the numbers in terms of um, who's being treated. I just wondered if you had any comments or thoughts on that, Dr. Weefling. Yeah, I mean, that is the problem, right? So all these tools, the UPenn tool, the UMass tool that we're using for modeling, they do, they do, not, they do not take into account necessarily the the, um, the folks that aren't getting captured by testing. And at the more uh, limited testing is in an, in an area, uh, the less accurate those are. So this now is giving us a way of looking at our presumed positives as well as our actual positives. So we're getting a little more information on, on the disease. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, you know, if this saves a life, um, I, hope, I hope that everybody that's listening will hear me today right now. Uh, these patients are, they, they get sick quickly. So they're, they're going along, you think they're gonna be fine. It seems like it's just a cold. And then suddenly they have, you know, the cytokine storm and within eight hours they are in the hospital. And if they're not in the hospital, they are dead. And so you need to, you need to be telling your clinical teams that this is, that they are critical patients, even though they may not be sitting in the hospital. Hmm. And then what, what do you think in terms of what percentage of these critical patients are presumed positive versus confirmed positives? Can you, can you repeat that? You know, what percentage of these patients that are kind of coming in as presumed positives that you guys are taking care of are um, in this critical, critical condition? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, for, so we had, um, I can only give you the numbers that I have. So these are yeah. very rough numbers, right? And this is from like two days ago or so. Uh, we had somewhere in the vicinity of 230 um, actually tested positive COVID cases. Um, and we had about 470 patients in the tool that were self-isolating. Oh my gosh. So almost twice as many. Yep. That's amazing. Now, wow. is some of that, you know, you have to factor in the fact that some of those patients may have just been flu, but we couldn't tell the difference and we couldn't actually test. We stopped testing for flu because we didn't have the kits. So we didn't have, we didn't have reagent to run the tests and we didn't have the kits to do the nasal swabs because the kits come from Italy. And so uh, we were very much paralyzed. Oh my goodness. So some of those patients are probably flu, but as we look at our flu, our rapid swabs, which we're still doing, um, those numbers have been going down. Um, so we do believe that flu is on the decline as it would normally be in March. 
Mm -hmm. well, well, I know you do have to um, jump off, Dr. Weepling, so I do want to tell you again, we really appreciate you um, being on the phone with us today and um, send our best to you and, and all your colleagues there. Yeah, no, thank you, and uh, God bless y'all. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Al, do you want to follow up with some more questions for um, Levi and Yuri? Sure. Um, there was a question about uh, are there standards in Israel uh, that allow uh, for a longitudinal patient record that can be used to uh, manage not only this but other information? Uh, and uh, Uri or, or Levy, maybe you would like to talk about the national health record, the DB Motion platform that's used there? And, and the fact ahead. that PGHD, patient-generated health data, is now becoming part of it, but it, it hasn't been. So, Uri, I know you've been active there, trying to make it part of the record. Um, yeah, in general, in Israel, we have four HMOs um, that um, um, share share um, share the data with the with the with the government and the hospitals. Um, it's um, it's, uh, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, it's a DB Motion uh, um, uh, technology. Basically, when you when you're being um, admitted to the hospital, the hospital have the way to to look at your um, uh, medical file in, uh, in one of the HMOs that you, that you confronted with. Yes, um, and with regards to standards, though, you use the same standards the U.S. does, HL7, FHIR, et cetera. Um, it's le less common in Israel in that regards. Um, Levi, I don't know if you would like to, to add on your own. No, it's uh, uh, it, we have some advantages structurally because the country is uh, smaller, it's um, more concentrated. As Uri said, uh, two of those four HMOs represent 80% of the market. The Ministry of Health can make those players play nice. Um, so no, we haven't had a need for um, the, the same kind of interoperability tools that the US uh, requires because it's already more homogenized. Yeah. Could you imagine if the U.S. was Kaiser, Intermountain, Geisinger, and UPMC, right? Four large HMOs. Um, what about the role of patient-generated data as part of those HMOs and the records? Is that moving forward faster than it is here in the States? We're still dabbling with it here. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and actually all four HMOs um, and the main hospital system actually, uh, we, we work with all of them and, and um, they all have um, implemented some sort of way of using patient-generated patient health data as part of the clinical uh, um, processes. Um, it may be from uh, um, EPROs, uh, patient reported outcomes, um, surveys. Um, it can be in, in programs like CHF, cardiac rehab, um, oncology, oncology symptom management. We've just deployed the first hospital, psychiatry hospitalization in Israel um, with a full, full blown um, 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 inpatient protocol that is being done um, at the patient, uh, patient's house. So, yes. Yeah. We had a question, has there been inquiries from New York City about this set of capabilities? There have been some conversations, but not enough. They're very busy. They're way more consumed. You see it on the news. It's worse than Rochester there. But I do wish that uh, some uh, satellite groups could take the time, because this is very rapidly deployed capabilities. It's not the three to five month project. It could be up in a week uh, or less. So if anybody has contacts in New York or New Jersey or places where COVID is not yet, I'll be pleased to, to chat about that. Any other questions? I'm scrolling through them. Yeah. Uh, it seems any? like there's a lot of folks that are interested in the playbook and um, the epic piece and um, some additional info. So I'm thinking Ali and Claudia, or maybe we'll send out after this, in addition to a link to the webinar, we could send out links to that tool and, and we'll get those email addresses for those of you who submitted them to Dr. Weaveling so she can um, follow up with you on the playbook. Um, I, I really, again, want to thank, we've come, it's three o'clock. I really, again, want to thank Al um, and Strategic Interests for, um, you know, supporting this program today. And again, just send our best to everybody who's out there right now. 
um, fighting the good fight. And um, Al, this, there, there's a lot of interest in this. So I think we're going to have to do this again. <laughs> right. And I'm sure there are uh, a, a lot of uh, variants of it. So uh, terrific. And thanks, everyone, for your time today. Thank you to Levy, uh, Dr. Weefling, Uri, and uh, everybody else. And be safe. Thank stay you. home, stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. You well.